All right, get your Bibles ready. Don't turn anywhere yet, because I'm not even sure where I want to turn yet. But we are starting a new topic tonight. And after much prayer and consideration, there was a lot of things I thought of doing. And, and this one may seem a little awkward to a number of you. But basically, what's been going on that's been really capturing my attention is the high level of suicides that are out there nowadays. There are so many suicides among teenagers and even adults right now. And uh, the, the, the skyrocketing of a drug abuse and drug use is out there. The drinking, the heroin is just out of control. And just recently, our government talked about how they're opening new cases about UFOs, right? And that there's maybe possibility of aliens and people are getting really intrigued into the aliens and, and all these kind of things. So my mind immediately... Uh, for the past couple months, which probably is not a very good thing, jumped onto demonology. What are demons? What can demons do? What, are demons real? What, what does the Bible say about demons? So tonight, we're going to start talking about demonology. We're going to study to see what the Bible has to say about demons. And one of the things I don't like doing is talking on this subject. And this is the reason why, with fear and trepidation, I come to this because it's been my experience that people have a very unique fascination with evil. It's something about us that are drawn, something about the human nature, or the sin nature, I should say, that we tend to want to know more about the occult. We tend to want to know more about the darker side. We tend to want to know more about demons than we do about the holy angels or about how to live right for the Lord. It just seems that the darkness seems to attract us more than anything else. So what happens is, is that when someone teaches on this subject, I remember when I was a young Christian and someone taught on this subject, and then they, talk, they taught on uh, different music and different things like that, and when they brought out certain uh, things about some rock and roll and heavy rock and roll and things like that, uh, when I sat back in there, instead of saying, oh, I got to stay away from it, I said, oh, I got to go look into this myself. And I started delving into it and started swamping my mind with those type of things. And pretty soon, I wasn't a very happy Christian. And so, we are going to be studying demonology. So let's remember, keep our focus on Christ. Keep our focus on the Lord. Don't get too engrossed. Don't get too far in demonology. You're, 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 I guarantee it. It's going to happen. Your interest is going to be piqued one way or another. It's going to happen because your sin nature is going to want to do it. You need to just resist that and just go forward with keeping your focus on Christ and the focus on the Word of God, okay? So with that, with that fear and trepidation, let's jump into demonology. First lesson tonight is going to be, what are the characteristics of demons? Now, I know a lot of people talk a lot about demons and what they are and who they are and, and they say some things. I'm going to do my best to keep things relegated to the Word of God. All right, because a lot of times ideas about demons come from the old occult. They'll come from the idea of old Jewish traditions or old Babylonian traditions or Greek traditions and how it's made its way into Christianity and all that kind of stuff. We're going to try and stick to the best way we can with the word of God. I call it demonology, but and the reason why I call it demonology is because the Greek word translated for these creatures, the word demons, is dia, daimonion. Daimonion is translated in your New Testament, in your, in your King James Version, as devils. Now, that, that's a little misrepresentation in my mind, because it's not the, it's not the Greek word for devil. Uh, the Greek word for devil is diabolos, and that's the word for devil. So you think that if these were going to be devils, the, the, the Greek word would have been diabolos, but it's not. It's daimonion. It's, it's actually a demon. It's a, it's a different category category of it. Um, now, so I had to think about why did the King James translator start translating it this way? Well, take your Bible, go to Revelation chapter number 12. We've already covered this, but it's just nice to see this verse. And again, we're doing a topical study. We may jump around a lot. I'm going to try and keep things in the same ballpark at least. In Revelation chapter number 12, remember we were talking about this. This is the war that is taking place over the Christ child. From the very beginning of the inception where Satan is in, in heaven and such like that. Uh, in Revelation chapter number 12, verse number 9, it says, it, it identifies this war in heaven. It identifies God's arch enemy, though they are not equal by any stretch of the imagination. Satan was created, all right? So don't think of an arch enemy as being equal with God and one may win and one may lose. When I say arch enemy, I'm just saying he is the one that has positioned himself to turn this world against the Lord. He's the one that brought sin into this universe. He's the one that brought sin into this world and therefore is God's arch enemy. He's already defeated. He's already 
done, all right? So don't, don't think of it like Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader and the dark side and the good side and the light and yin and yang fighting each other. That's the furthest thing from the word of God. You have God, which is good and right and holy and perfect. He's already won the battle. It's already done. He does allow these things to take place. So just want to bring that up when I call it arch enemy. You don't get the wrong picture. Verse number nine, it says it identifies Satan. And it says, the, and the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil. That's the word diabolos. The old world called the, de- the old uh, serpent called the devil. And Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, it's interesting. We're going to see this in a moment about Satan, uh, the angels being cast out, are going to turn into these demons. So it appears to me that what's going on is, is that Satan is the one and only devil. He is the one and only Diabolos. But he's got a lot of henchmen. He's got a lot of ambassadors underneath him. He's got a lot of them that go out and do his bidding and try to do his things. And when they do that, that's why they are considered to be called devils. Right? Even though the Greek word is demonion, they are called devils because they are doing the work of the devil, Satan himself, is his representation. Just like we are called, if you are a genuine one, you are called a Christian. Why are you called a Christian? Because our head and our director is Christ, right? We're not little Christ. We're not little Jesuses. We're, we're not like that. But we are representing Jesus Christ in this world. So if you are a genuine born-again believer, you could be called a Christian, right? Because that's what you're, you're representing the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like these demons, they are their own category. They are called demons, but they are representing the devil himself. And what happens with that is people get a wrong perspective now who Satan is. Because there's so many demons out in this world, it almost appears that Satan is omnipresent. That Satan is all over the place doing all kinds of things. But let me tell you something. Satan's just an angel. He's a fallen angel. He can only be in one place at one time. He is not God. But he has deceived the world into thinking that he's just like God or he's the evil God. And so what these devils do, these these little demons, One of the main things they do is they broadcast Satan's works out. So it makes Satan appear that he's in all places at all times. It gives him an appearance of omnipresence. How do these demons come into existence? Well, we saw already there that they happened that, well, go go to Revelation chapter 12, verse number three. It says here, and this is at the beginning, of, like I said, in Revelation chapter 12, we're looking at the history of good versus evil with all the main players, right? And this, we, we already talked the symbolism of this when I went through this. Hopefully it's not going to be confusing to you. But in Revelation chapter 12, verse number 3, it says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, that great red dragon is Satan himself, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. That's not exactly how he looked like, but that's all we talk about. That's symbolic of who he represents in the book of Revelation. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which is Israel in this passage, which was ready to be delivered for devour her child as soon as it was born. From the very beginning, Satan has been out to destroy the Lord Jesus Christ and anything that has to do with Jesus Christ. If you are taking my class on Thursday night, which we should be having it this Thursday. I forgot to read my Zoom meeting this Thursday um, online. If you need that information, let me know. But we've been following from the very beginning throughout these eras. We're following this scarlet... uh, 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 Woven, what's the thing? Yarn, I guess you could say. Uh, There's a different word, but it's not coming through my head. It's something going on, all right? It's going on, a thread, that's it. A scarlet thread, a, a scarlet ribbon going from the very beginning to the very end of the Lord Jesus Christ's life and the promise of the Messiah to come. And then we're also watching how Satan is trying to devour it all the way through. And it's going to be really interesting when we get to the book of Kings. Because the book of Kings, if you did not know, and you haven't been part of that study or didn't read it very well, the book of Kings, it drops down to one baby human being that's left. Satan gets all the others destroyed. But then there was one handmaid, one lady, who stole one little child away. That was the only one left on this earth that was part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. 
It was amazing how that worked out. And so uh, we're going we're to be studying that, how Satan's trying to destroy it. Well, this is what this is referring to here, where Satan is trying to devour the child, trying to devour Jesus Christ, the Messiah, before he gets born into this earth. And what happens is when Satan sinned up in heaven, we're not studying Satanology, so we're not going to jump into that one. But Satan was the first, or not the first, he was the anointed cherub. Some would say that he was the most prominent creation that God ever created, this, this individual called Lucifer, this cherub. He was basically God's, he, he, he conducted the, the chorus, the worship up in heaven. He, he was probably greater than Michael and greater than, and, and, and the way it goes with the, the angels' rankings and such like that. Lucifer was the pinnacle creation of God. Matter of fact, the book of Isaiah and Ezekiel talk about how, how beautiful he is and there wasn't anything that was greater than him. And he was the anointed chair. He was the, he was the best one. Well, because of that, pride entered into his heart. And through that sin, because he said, I don't want to be under God, I will be God because of his prominent position. That's how sin entered into this universe. Well, with his campaigning or with his wisdom, with his, well, deception, wisdom on the bad side, he was able, like the word of God says here, with his tail as a figurative picture, he was able to take one third of the stars with him. The stars here representing angels. So out of the angelic realm, when God first created the heavens and the earth, before sin ever entered into this world, Satan, the deceiver, the diabolos, the devil, the deceiver, was able to get one-third of the angelic realm to fall with him, to follow him. Those are the ones that I believe became the demons. They are the fallen angels. So when you're looking at the characteristics of these creatures, we see the original fall of Lucifer. He took one third of them with him. We already saw that in verse uh, number nine, Revelation chapter 12. Look at verse number nine since we're there. And it says, and the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So Satan has a group of angels that follows him, that their allegiance is to him, that have made the choice to follow Satan rather than God. They are the unholy angels. They are the demons. They are called the devil's angels. Take your Bible, go to Matthew chapter 25. The book of Matthew chapter number 25. In this parable, there is the judgment of the Gentiles and how they treated Israel during the tribulation period. And if they were truly saved, like we're talking about on Sunday, if you have truly know Jesus Christ as your Savior, your life is going to change and you're going to love the brethren. You're going to serve things like that. Well, these people did not. There's a group there that one of the sections did not serve the Jews during that time. So it shows, it demonstrated that they never truly trusted Christ as their Savior. So there is a judgment cast upon them. Verse number 40 says this. Matthew chapter 25, verse 40 says, And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Insomuch as ye have not done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done, you have done it unto me. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And then it talks about when I was hungry, you didn't feed me, you didn't give me thirst. So right there, we see again, even the Lord Jesus Christ acknowledges that Satan has, or the devil, has his unholy angels as his horde. And that is the reason why hell was created. It was a judgment for Satan and the angels, is how hell originally started. Now what's interesting is, and sometimes it's hard to do, because the word of God really doesn't give us a whole bunch of information but there seems to be two different groups of these angels, these demons that are out there today. The one group are those that are confined right now. They are confined into Tartarus, a place of, of the abyss, let's call it. But then there's this other group that's allowed to roam around with Satan himself. All right? So we can see that happening here. Go to Jude 6, the book of Jude Verse number six. Sorry, we're jumping all over the place tonight. 
It's just one of those things. There's not a whole lot of information packed down in one spot. You kind of have to jump around the Word of God because he doesn't talk about it too often. But in Jude chapter 6, notice what it says here. This is, of course, we've studied this and how to study your Bible. So those that have taken that class, this will be a good reminder for you. Maybe I'll call, put you on the spot and ask you some questions. See how well you remember this. No, I wouldn't do that to you. But in Jude chapter 6, it says this, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habita habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So what Jude 6 is referring to, it's talking about these false teachers and how they deserve judgment. And if God was going to judge these angels who left their first estate and has confined this group to this place where un, in, in the darkness with everlasting chains, who are these guys? Or what, what kind of angels are these that left their first estate? Well, jump over to 2 Peter. We just found Jude three books back. Second Peter's talking about the very similar situation in chapter number two. And he says this, talking about the false teachers are going to be condemned. And he says this in verse number four. Second Peter chapter two, verse four. For if God spared not the angels, that sinned. So that's how they fell from their first estate. That's how they left their first habitation. They sinned. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell. What's very interesting about that word hell, right? Normally you think of the place of fire and brimstone, the lake of fire, which we call hell. Well, actually, do you know there's three different words for hell in the Bible? There's three different words. The first word we could talk about for the lake of fire in Hebrew is Gehenna. Gehenna means the eternal fire, the non-stopping fire. That's the one that we would call the lake of fire. That's the one that burns forever and ever and ever. That's translated as hell in your Bible. There's a second one translated as hell, and that word is Hades in the Greek. Hades in the Greek means an awaiting place, not a purgatory. You can't get out of it. Hades is an awaiting place that once the person dies, if they don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, they go there and they are waiting, like we talked about in eschatology, they are waiting for the great white throne judgment, for their ultimate judgment where they get cast into hell. This is the place, the place of Hades is the place that the rich man is in right now when Jesus told the event of the rich man and Lazarus. Remember, Lazarus was the beggar who put his faith in what Moses had to say. And so he was a child of God. When that beggar died, he was immediately taken into Abraham's bosom. But the rich man who rejected the Bible, who rejected to trust Christ as their Savior in all statements, we get all fairness. When he rejected that, the Bible said he went down into hell. And that word hell was Hades. And in there we see that he is tormented day and night. Everyone in Hades gets equally tormented right now. When hell happens, when they have to finally stand before the great right throne seat judgment, and they get judged for the works they have done, then throughout eternity, they have different, I believe, different classifications of hell for what they've actually done. So those are the two, Greek, uh, two words you'll find in your Bible for hell. Peter is the only one that uses the third word. The third word which he uses in this passage is Tartarus. Tartarus refers to a special place where fallen angels are held. This is the place that we would see in the book of Revelation. We saw it when we studied that called the bottomless pit. This was also called the abyss. Remember these confined demons that are down there. We saw when the fifth trumpet blows, an angel's going to come down and he's going to open up the bottomless pit and those demons are going to come out and torment men for three months. Remember we, remember we saw that when we studied the book of Revelation? Those demons were going to be able to come out. But they're confined right now. And this is what it's saying right here in verse number four. For if God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down into, you may want to circle that and put the word Tartarus. This is the abyss, the bottomless pit. And cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So it's talking about how God is going to 
protect those that are his, but he's going to judge those that are not his. But now begs the question, what is this talking about? What event is this? Because not all angels are in there. But if you read 2 Peter here and you read Jude, it sounds like all the angels that left their first habitation, that habitation of holiness, that place where they were with God up in heaven and Satan, and they decided to follow Satan, it sounds like all those angels were cast in this place called Tartarus. But that's not always the case. Because we do know demons are around about. Jesus had to cast them out. Jesus had an interaction with them. Paul had an interaction. I think we have interaction with them today, but we don't even realize it. There are demons out there even today. So why are these ones confined and the other ones not confined? I'll tell you this, there's no good answer for it. But I will show you the prominent idea. One of the prominent ideas is this. Take your Bible. And go to Genesis chapter number 6. This is a very highly debate, de, debated, debated passage. In Genesis chapter number 6. If you've been taking my Thursday night class, we've covered this in depth as well. So hopefully I can call on you and you'd be able to teach this part. But in Genesis chapter number 6, verses 1 through 8, the word of God says this. And it came to pass... When men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God, and right there is going to be where the controversy is, and I'll explain where the controversy is, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, Yet his days shall be 120 years. That means from this time on, it was going to be 120 years before the flood that man was going to be judged. Verse number four says, There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them. And the same, those that were born from the sons of, men, uh, sons of God and the daughters of men, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. That means they were heroic. That means they were very powerful. They were, they were very strong men, very, uh, like I said, very heroic men. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. We're not too far from that today, are we, it seems. Well, I don't know, maybe, who knows. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So this is during the time of Noah, 120 years before the flood is going to take place, where man, where the judgment of all the earth is going to take place. Only eight people get saved on that ark. Noah and his family. Everybody else perishes. Well, an instant that takes place before there is this idea here. And this idea is that the sons of God are those fallen angels. And that those fallen angels had sexual relations with human beings. And when they had these sexual relations with these human beings, there were these giants called Nephilims. And these Nephilims became mighty men. And these Nephilims became super strong because they were a half-breed between demons or angel, fallen angels and human beings. And because that boundary was crossed, God took those angels those fallen angels, those demons, and he can find them because they crossed the line they weren't supposed to cross. And so he can find them to the place of Tartarus, and he allowed the other ones that did not have that type of relation with human beings to be able to still freely roam with Satan and to do his bidding as henchmen. That is a very popular view. It's not one that I necessarily hold. And I'm going to say this, I'm not going to fight you over this passage. It's just, it's just not worth it. We just don't know. And in the long run, it really doesn't make a difference what you really truly believe in this passage means. You will say, Pastor, that's what it sounds like, the sons of God. Well, where, where, why do you have problems with it being fallen angels? I don't have anywhere in the Bible where a fallen angel is called a son of God. 
There's nowhere in the Bible that a, a demon is called the son of God. So that, that makes it kind of rough for me on that point. The other point is, too, that when Jesus Christ died, Jesus Christ came down as a man, not part man, part angel. And he came down to redeem that which needed to be redeemed. And he redeemed the human race. Right? So there's, there's, there, and there's a bunch of other ones that have problems with that, with that view. So then, pastor, what is your view on this? Well, there's this other idea that the sons of God refers to the godly line of Seth. The line that the Messiah was, remember, Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel. Eve and everybody, they're praying for this. God said he's going to give them a son. He gives them Seth. The Bible says that during this time of Seth's life, that men started to call upon the name of the Lord again when Seth was born. And so Seth was considered a child of God or a son of God where the Messianic line was supposed to come. But his line did something wrong. It did not stay pure. It married the daughters of men. It married, say, like the daughters of Cain, those that were pagan, those that were ungodly. And God never wants the holy mixed with the unholy. And so that when this happened, you had the godly line of Seth is now going to be polluted by the ungodly line of the pagans. And so therefore, God's judgment was to make these men of renown to have these, you know, superhuman type powers or whatever to do it and so that's when god said that's enough and through the godly line of seth the one that actually found grace that didn't pollute the line was going to be noah and then god started over with noah after the flood are there issues with that theory of course there are because four times the word sons of god are used in the old testament three out of the four if you're including this one could refer to angels especially in the book of jobs and other places there's one place it refers to a human being so you got you know there's just there's just too many things and then you have the problem that i have here is well what does it mean that the angels that left their first estate what what does that mean if it's not when they did something else besides fall from heaven because it would imply that all the fallen angels are over into into uh into the abyss right so no matter what, what style you choose, you're going to have a problem with your theology. There, there, it just depends on which worm you want to try and crack, all right? That's, that's, all, that's, that's the only thing that you've got to worry about with this. But there's an idea that these angels that are, or these demons that are confined are those that are cross the barrier. Now, you've got to be careful with that because there's going to be people out there. If you take that position, they're going to say, well, I, I'm invaded by a, a, a demon of lust. And then I'm over there and I'm... I'm uh, you know, I got, I got molested by a demon. You'll see that on TV and everything now. There's all kinds of movies and filth like that. Well, the problem with that would be that if this were true, God can find all those that breached that gap. He's already confined them to Tartarus, so it wouldn't be happening today. All right, so that's just one of those aspects of it. Um, what about this side with the godly line of Seth? Then who would I say were the ones that were confined? I would say the ones that were confined were the ones that, you know, up in heaven... We haven't studied angelology, but up in heaven, there's different levels of angels. Angels are not all created equal. You have cherubim, you have seraphim, you have the four creatures, you have all kinds of different angels up in heaven that range in all different types of power. Just like Satan was the most powerful, I would believe. If, well, at the point before he fell, Michael is the most powerful. He's God's fighting angel. But those angels are the most powerful at that point in time. So maybe there was a whole group of cherubim. Or a whole bunch of the seraphim that followed Satan and they were too powerful. So God decided I'm going to confine them because that would be too much for the human race to be able to put up with. I don't know. I just know that somewhere along the lines, the Bible does say that there is a group of demons that are confined. There's a group of demons that God so chose, whatever it was, because they left their first estate, because they sinned, because they left their first habitation, whatever that all encompasses, whether it's the Genesis 6 passage or something else we're not privy to, he took that group of angels and they are reserved in the place called Tartarus right now. But then that leaves us all the other demons that are out there that are unconfined right now. What are those that we should be worried about. Now this is going to be a weird study. And what I'm talking about here is. Like I said. I'm just going to relate it to what the word of God has to say. Alright. So demons. Some are confined. We see that they fell with Satan. That they are considered Satan's angels. Unholy angels. We call them demons. What do they look like? What do they do? 
What are their characteristics? Well, we do know that demons are disembodied spirits. Disembodied spirits means they are not able to walk around. They do not have their own material human body. All right? Take your Bible and go to Matthew chapter 12. They are described throughout the word of God. These demons are described as spirits. And they are constantly seeking to possess someone or some animal. Because that is how they interact with the physical world. They will possess. When you're talking about demon possession, you're talking about one of these disembodied spirits, one of these unholy angels that are able to enter into a human being and take over their mental faculties and their physical faculties for quite some time. That's what a demon can do. Let's see what it looks like here. Here we have in Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45, the Lord Jesus Christ is teaching a very valuable lesson on how a person needs to be saved. If they're not saved, then they just get their life cleaned up. Now, I'm not against AA and NA and those kind of things. They have their proper place to a certain degree. But I will say this, if they don't teach you to put your trust in the one and only Lord Jesus Christ, they're going to do you more harm than good, according to this passage. Look what this passage says. You can clean yourself up, but if you, don't, if you don't trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're going to open up a whole world of hurt. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 43, Jesus says this, When the unclean spirit, the unclean spirit, of course, is a demon. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. So here's someone that has a problem with a demon. The demon leaves. This guy cleans up or whatever. This demon goes out and leaves. He's looking for another body to possess. He's looking for another creature to possess. Then he saith, okay, this is what I'll do then. I will return into my house, meaning the body of that individual, of that man. Then he saith, I'll return into my house from whence or from where I came out. And when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept and garnished. You see, so well, some, for some instances, now this is not every instance, and that's where we're gonna, when we talk about demon possession, I'm not saying everyone that's addicted is demon possessed. I'm not saying that at all. But there are some instances that the demon inside of them can help cause that addiction. When that demon leaves, that addiction can go away for a while, and the guy can get himself all cleaned up. He can stop the drinking, stop the smoking, stop the pornography, stop whatever it is. He can get his life all cleaned up for a while and think he's doing good. But since he never trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior, he doesn't have the Holy Spirit residing inside of him. He's still spiritually empty. So the demon looking around to cause trouble somewhere else says, you know what? I haven't found someone that was as fun as that guy. I'm going to cause more problems over there. Let me go back to this guy. He goes back and he possesses this guy. And now he says, hey, look, this house is all cleaned up. This guy got his life. He hasn't done drugs. He hasn't looked at porn. He hasn't done anything for quite some time. His life's all cleaned up. Look what happens. Verse 45. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so it shall be also unto this wicked generation. The picture is you get victory on your own and you've done this great stuff and maybe God was your cup, right? I know unfortunately sometimes AA has gone so far and I've seen movies and I've, I've been to a couple meetings and they've even said that, that you just have to believe in a higher power. Your higher power could be anything. Your higher power could be this iPad if you want. Just as long as you have a higher power in your life. And so you got someone trusting in this higher power. And they're, and they're praying to this higher power. And they're looking for this higher power for health. And they get their life cleaned up and this demon knows it. So he leaves them and he makes them feel good like everything's going good in his life. And then he comes on back and he says, hey, this place is good. I'm going to get seven more demons that are more wicked than me. And now I'll inhabit that guy and see how easy it is to kick this habit now. See what it's going to be now. His house is all clean and washed up and ready to go. We'll put seven more in there. And now the, the last state is worse than the first. 
I'm sure you've known people like that. I'm not saying everybody does that. And, I'm, and again, I don't want to knock someone that does a good job at what they're doing and they have been sober and done and everything. My best admonition to you is make sure you've trusted Christ as your Savior. That's the number one thing you need to do. I'm not knocking you. Congratulations, all that good stuff. But you've got to be careful because the Word of God says that if you get those seven other demons inside of you, your last state, meaning the state that you are in now when those seven others get inside of you, is going to be a whole lot worse than it was first. And I know I've known people that have gone through a hard thing, cleaned up their life, maybe clean and sober for a year, two years, three years, and then they get on back into it, and boy, they get into it pretty heavy. And you try to encourage them to help to get it out, and it is almost impossible for them to clean it up. And they struggle, and they struggle till they lose all determination, say, I can't do this. What's the use? And they just get overcome. Not, again, this is, Jesus is, of course, referring to, in case you didn't know what he's referring to, Jesus, of course, is referring to the nation of Israel, how the nation of Israel has rejected his teachings for so long, but they've cleaned themselves up through legalism. And then when the true Messiah came, they really didn't want anything to do with them because they were more happy about themselves. That's what's going on, but it's still a spiritual principle that he's teaching here about being cleaned up on your own. Go to Luke chapter number 8, and then I'll stop here. We're looking at them being disembodied spirits. In Luke chapter number 8, the demonic of Gadarenes. But that's going to be a good study when we get to that because we're going to see how demons really treat people. And we're going to be able to look at our culture. And this is the reason why I'm doing this as well, folks. You're going to be able to see how God has revealed what demons do to people and what he allows people to do. And you're going to look at our culture and you're going to say, we're a pretty demon-possessed culture. And you're going to see that. And, and it's going to be kind of eye-opening, I think, when we start comparing stuff. But in Luke chapter number 8, Jesus is casting out the demon in this demoniac. We're not going to get too far into it. And Jesus says this in verse 30. And Jesus asked him, the demon, saying, what is thy name? And this demon responds, and he said, legion, because many devils or demons, many devils were entered into him. So it shows that more than one demon can inhabit an individual. That's kind of scary. We've already seen one. We've seen seven more, so that makes eight. And now we see this one called legion, and a legion is a thousand. Because many devils were entered into him, and they besought him, the devils besought Jesus, that he would not command them to go out into the deep. Again, that is being cast out and thrown into Tarsus, Right? And you'll notice that sometimes when Jesus casts them out, they say, hey, it's not our time yet to be cast into Tarsus yet. It's not our time yet. You know, you can't, please don't do that to us. But they besought Jesus and they said, don't, don't, it's not our time, basically. They, they, uh, not, uh, they would not command them, those that are underneath the command of the Lord Jesus Christ, to go out into the deep. And there was there a herd of many swine feeding on the mountain. And they besought him, they besought Jesus, that Jesus would suffer or permit them, the demons, to enter into the swine. So Jesus allowed them to get away from the humanity. And now you see these demons, they are dispossessive of the body. So now they want to go into something else because they want to cause havoc and destruction. They want to go into the swine. Jesus permits it. Don't ask me why he permitted it. I don't know. He's God. I'm not. He allowed them to go into this swine. I know what happens to these animals that are demon-possessed. Verse 33, Then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake, and they were choked. Demons aren't about giving life. Demons aren't about helping. Demons are all about hurting destroying, violence, death. That's what demons are all about. Aren't you thankful that we have the Lord Jesus Christ who is greater than any demon. He gives nothing but life and love and help and strength. And if you are stuck in an addiction, if you were possessed by a demon, if for whatever reason you cleaned up your life and now it's worse than it ever was, it's the Lord Jesus Christ that can give you that perfect cleanliness. And the only way anyone can ever, I'm going to get asked this question, I'm going to cover it more in detail later, but I get asked this question all the time when I get this. Can a 
Christian, be demon-possessed? And the, abs- the answer is absolutely not. It's an impossibility because in order to possess my faculties, in order to possess my body, you got to kill the strong man of this house. And guess who's living in my temple? Right. It's the Holy Ghost. It's God himself. And so what it would take would be Satan and his demons would have to be stronger than God in order to possess my body because I'm a Christian and I've trusted Christ. I can't be possessed. Now, I can be oppressed. We'll get that a little bit later. But I can't be possessed. But there can be people out there that you know that you may work with, a lot of young children, because we're going to study a little bit. I'm debating how much I want to study it of how demon possessions could take place when we study in the book of Deuteronomy all the areas that God says stay away from because they lead to demon possession. One of them is drugs. You, you, you see a kid on drugs? You ever see them have superhuman strength? What do they think about? Death? Some of them? Suicide? No help? No hope? Despondent? Cutting themselves? That's, we're going to see that's all related to demonic activity. That's all related to demonic activity. We're going to see that. The only hope for them is the Lord Jesus Christ. The only hope for us is the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the conquering king. He's won this battle. Don't be afraid tonight. I know there's probably some people listening. They're going to go home and they're like, Ugh. you know, Pastor, why are you talking about that? I don't want to think about that. And when I do look at this culture, this culture is scary. Yeah, it is. All the more reason you need to know Christ as your Savior. I'm very thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll talk about this next week as the Lord allows, and we'll see they're not only disembodied spirits seeking to possess people, but one of the main terms they are called is an unclean spirit. What does it mean to be an unclean spirit? We'll cover that next week. Sorry, I hope I didn't scare any of you. Keep your focus. Like I said, keep your focus on Christ. Don't get engrossed in this other garbage. It's just something that we want to learn and keeps us, our, our awareness up. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll go ahead and be, uh, take prayer requests, and then we'll pray with one another. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, and I do pray that, Lord, that these aspects, though they may be scary, though they may be intimidating, though they may be something that we don't like to think about, you've placed them in your word. You've given us reason to think about it. You wanted us to be aware of this section of the spiritual realm that we don't fully comprehend, but we know that's there. But Lord, I pray if there's someone here that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, that tonight they would repent of their sin and put their total trust and faith, not in some object, but in the one and only Savior, Jesus Christ. He alone died for them. He alone was buried and rose again, and he alone can cleanse them. He alone can give them eternal life. He alone can give them protection and comfort and grace and hope. So I pray, Father, there's someone here that doesn't know Christ as their Savior. I pray tonight would be the night that they put their total trust and faith in him. And then, Father, I pray for us as Christians, help us not to be so ignorant of the spiritual realm that we constantly dabble in demonic things and perhaps we're maybe even oppressed and we don't even realize it because we've allowed the wrong type of things in our lives. And maybe we're seeing some of our actions and attitudes starting to sway in some areas that it ought not. Father, help us repent of that. Help us keep our focus on you. Help us keep our focus on your son. Father, tonight, if this was scary to someone, we remind ourselves we are not given the spirit of fear but of a sound mind. Help us to think on that which is good and right and just and holy. Lord, help us to think on you and your word. Thank you for giving us victory over this very evil topic that we're talking about. Thank you for being our Lord. Please bless your people here tonight as only you can. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.